In the last session, we explored the thermodynamics of electrode processes. In this session, we're now going to look at the kinetics of what goes on at the electrode. So we looked at what happens when we have equilibrium established at the electrodes. But now let's consider what happens when we allow a current to flow at the electrodes. So we've established what happens with electrochemical equilibria, but now what we're going to do is explore what happens when we disturb that equilibrium by applying an external potential. Fundamentally, we want to look at what happens to the current as the potential varies. What do we expect to happen and what predictions can we make? If we apply a higher potential difference, do we get a higher current? Is there a linear relationship between them? And should there be a linear relationship between them? Through exploring these questions, we will start to find out what's going on at the electrode. Fundamentally in chemistry, we want to consider rates of reaction. So when we think of regular reactions, we apply the principles of these rate laws. So we're familiar with forming a rate equation, such as this, the rate of change of the concentration of A with respect to time is equal to the negative of the rate constant times the concentration. This is for a first order process. We can apply similar principles to electrode processes. So at the electrode, what's going on? Well, let's think, first of all, we are transferring a certain number of electrons. If we're transferring a certain number of electrons, we can then consume a certain fraction, a certain proportion of reactant. So we have n moles of reactant being consumed. This, of course, assumes a single electron process. So this means that we can find the overall charge transferred, big Q, as the number of electrons times the Faraday constant multiplied by the number of moles of reactant consumed. So this is a simple relationship between charge and the amount of reactant that we're working with. When we think of charge transfer, we start to think of what's going on with the electric current, because the current is the thing that we measure. Remember that current is simply the rate of charge transfer. So the rate of transfer of charge with respect to time. This gives us the current that we can observe. But we also have our rate of reaction, which is the rate of change of our reactant as a function of time as well. So fundamentally, we are looking at a rate equation, whether it's a rate of transfer of charge or a rate of consumption of reactant. Looking at this equation here between the overall charge transferred and the amount of reactant we have present, all we need to do is find our derivative, our first derivative with respect to time. So if we differentiate both sides, we'll get an expression. The rate of charge transfer with respect to time, our current, can be equated to the rate of the reaction and the Faraday constant. So this is a fairly straightforward way to look at the current flowing through our electrochemical cell and the reactions happening at the electrode. To understand a bit more, we need to go back to the area considerations. Remember we looked at the areas of electrodes because this is quite an important aspect of it. Many considerations that we work with involve using conductivity and conductivity fundamentally is an area function. So working with these cross-sectional areas becomes very, very useful. We apply similar principles to the electrode processes and the reasoning for that will become clear later on. But we are looking at the rate of a reaction per unit area. So if we take our rate of reaction, we simply divide it by the area of the electrode, we get an expression which relates our current to the area of those electrodes. The important thing we need to recognize here is that the current that flows is a representation of that rate of reaction. If the reaction happens faster, we would expect to get a faster rate of transfer of electrons, which would lead to a higher current observed in the circuit around the cell. Why is the area important? Well, let's look at what's going on at the electrode. So if we think about what's going on at this electrode, let's consider the cathode at first. So cations, these A plus ions, will gather at the surface of that electrode and they'll just deposit in a layer. Remember we saw this when we were looking at the inner Helmholtz plane and the diffuse double layer in one of our earlier sessions. So electrons will transfer from our electrode to our cation, reducing it, and it will deposit this atomic A at the surface. So what happens to the surface? So as each layer of cations is deposited at the surface and fundamentally reduced, this surface will advance. So as each layer gets there, we extend the electrode surface. And we get a similar process happening in reverse at the anode. So when we consider the overall area of the electrode, the greater the area, the more cations can access the electrode and deposit metal atoms at the surface. The rate expression, therefore, has to include an element of the area. And we see that that rate expression demonstrates the area deposition, the, the overall area of that electrode. When we want to think of the rate of this reaction, the reaction that we consider is first order. All that needs to happen is the cation just needs to get to the surface. What that means for our rate equation is that it is, becomes the amount of material produced per unit area per unit time. So the bigger the electrode, the faster the rate, the smaller the electrode, the, the slower the rate. 
So if we have a larger electrode area, we get more sites. And larger area, as we've said, gives us a higher rate. This means overall our rate equation, which we're familiar with, becomes this rate, whatever that might be, is a rate constant times the concentration of x. The more of x we have in solution, the faster the rate's going to go. It's worth considering the units of the rate constant of centimeters per second. Make sure that you can rationalize this, given that the concentration could be considered as moles per cubic centimeter, slightly different to the moles per decimeter that you're used to, but it is a congruent unit. Once we've considered both processes, we can now start to look at the overall rate of reaction. At any electrode, we need to consider both processes. We need to consider the oxidative process and the reductive process happening at that electrode. At equilibrium, at that e electric... At that electrochemical equilibrium, these processes are equal because there's no net flow of charge. But as we change the potential, one of them begins to dominate, whether we raise the potential or whether we lower the potential. So we can consider this equilibrium in this manner. So the overall rate is the balance of each process. The cathodic process where the oxidated species is reduced and becomes the reduced species. So the rate of this, the forward reaction, is what's happening in a cathodic process while the anodic process, the reduced species, goes backwards to the oxidized species and gives us an alternative rate constant. So looking at these rates at a single electrode, remember we can consider that the overall rate is the sum of the forward and back processes. So we have our forward process and our back process, which all add up to give us an overall rate of reaction, which we've earlier defined as this derivative. Because we have this area function, this I over A, it's easier to think of a current density rather than the current itself. Remember back in session three, we talked about charge flux and how that passes through a particular area of solution. If we consider, it, if we now substitute this J term in our current density, this makes our overall equation for a single electrode process where N equals one is simply the Faraday constant times the rates that we've established. There are a number of factors which affect our rate constant. The main one we're going to be looking at is the effect of the applied potential. But there are a number of things that can affect it, whether it's looking at temperature effects or potential effects. Remember also that your rate constant depends on the energies of activation. So this is something you're familiar with from your Arrhenius relationship. This delta G dagger is the energy of activation you previously knew as Ea, but you'll find it in textbooks much as delta G dagger. A fraction of this free energy helps the oxidation, so one proportion of it enhances the oxidative process, but the remaining fraction of that delta G inhibits the reduction, so it blocks reduction from happening. This leads us to the Butler-Volmer relation, which simply relates our observed current density to the oxidative process and the reductive process, where we have this enhancement of oxidation due to alpha, while the remaining is the inhibition of the reductive process. It's worth briefly drawing your attention to the fact that we have introduced another symbol. So we've introduced this eta term, which we've seen already to represent a viscosity, but in this case it represents an overpotential. If you're ever in any doubt as to what the symbol might mean, look at the units. Remember that the overall units of this expression have to go to zero. So the overpotential here is measured in volts, and that will allow your units to cancel. So what is this overpotential? Well, put simply, the overpotential is the difference between the equilibrium potential and the actual potential at an electrode. So if you think of your equilibrium cell potential, you can calculate that. Remember, we did that in part two. But the difference, once we find our equilibrium cell potential, we simply subtract that from the applied potential, what we're applying to that particular electrochemical cell. We can apply that potential from a voltage source, whether it's a battery or a potentiostat, and this has an effect on the Fermi level, as we spoke about in, our, in the last session. If we have a positive overpotential, that creates a higher potential, which has the effect of lowering the electron energy. So the Fermi level decreases, and that reduces the free energy barrier for oxidation. So our species then can easily be oxidized at the electrode, and that's how our reaction proceeds. However, if we create a negative overpotential, it creates a lower potential, which increases the electron energy. It has the effect of raising the Fermi level. Once we have raised the Fermi level, it reduces the free energy barrier for reduction, so our material is then reduced at the electrode. To summarize our overview of the kinetics of electrodes, 
We have to consider the fact that the rates of oxidation and reduction depend on the available surface area. We manage this by using our current density, this J term, which is simply the current flowing divided by the area available in the electrodes. Rates are first order at that electrode surface. This allows us to very easily and simply qualify what's going on at the electrode. At equilibrium, no current flows around our cell. So we have this constant exchange of charge at an electrode interface where the rate of reduction is equal to the rate of oxidation. So the charge transfer cancels out on both sides. Once we start applying potential, we start to change the rate of what's going on at that electrode. If we have a positive over potential, i.e. we have a more positive potential than the equilibrium state, we will get oxidation of the species favored at that electrode. While if we lower the potential, if you have a negative over potential, it will favor the reduction of what's going on. Once we've applied that potential, if we then complete the circuit, we then satisfy the conditions and a current will flow from the anode to the cathode and will do electrical work as it does so.